we are interviewing Matt Ferguson. I knew Matt his senior year in high school, actually, summer before. Uh, since then, he's one of my first students when I went to Trinity Church uh, years and years ago. Matt uh, was at Florida State, played football for Florida State, is now with the Eric Moore and Associates Advertising and Marketing. This is Matt's office. Matt's done very well for himself. That's the Charlotte skyline there. Uh, Matt, take us from there. Tell, tell us about your family and, and about life now, where you've where life has taken you since uh, high school. Well, I have a big family. I have five kids. That's My right. wife, Lori, and I have five. It's an interesting story because when Lori and I uh, got married 17 years ago now, I was an instant daddy of three. So our oldest three are from my wife's previous marriage. She went through a tragic situation where our God is a God that puts things together and he's a God of resurrection. And we've seen that in our lives. And and, uh, we've added two more to the mix and have a total of five. And their ages range from 12 to 24. That is a stretch. Yes, it is. (laughs) So whatever age group you want to talk about, you know, I've I've got my own youth small group just in my family. That's right. You do. You know, we're, ours is stretched a little bit, but we only have three. So 20 to 28 years of age stretch. So you've got a lot more going and you you can see all those perspectives all at one shot. And Because we're talking about youth workers and adolescents and all the way to 25, uh, because there is a change that really doesn't occur till girls or ladies are 22 and men are 25. Most people don't know that. So from middle school to then, really, they're in the market for us to know some things to help them along. Tell us about your middle school experience, middle school, high school, college. Who are the biggest influences in your life? In middle school, I went through a really rough time where I didn't really have an identity for myself, was identified as a gifted student, but I didn't perform at that level, continually disappointed my parents. And one day I I came home with yet another bad report from school and my parents really sat me down in my living room and pinned me down and, and said, now, Matt, you, you've never really dedicated your life to the Lord, have you? And I had to admit that I had not made that decision for myself at the age of about 12 in seventh grade. There in my living room, I gave my life to Christ, uh, led by my parents. So definitely my parents have been a strong influence from day one. They are amazing Christian people, as you know. Moving into high school, I got into sports, got into athletics, course, at that time, we had Coach Clark Blake, an amazing man that people in Lake County and the area where I grew up know all about Coach Blake, but he led our team to the state championship in 1983. I was not on that varsity squad. I was just a little freshman uh, JVer, but uh, I just always admired Coach Blake and uh you know, he retired after that season. So I was bummed that I didn't get coached by Coach Blake, but he was the leader of our Fellowship of Christian Athletes group at Eustis High School and uh, was just dynamic, impacted so many kids' lives. I consider him a mentor of mine. I had him as a teacher and he just brought that same enthusiasm to the classroom that he brought to the football field. So in a way, I still feel like I was coached by him and had the opportunity to to speak at his retirement. The coach really meant a lot to me. And then when I got into college, uh, went to Florida State and played for Coach Bowden, Bobby Bowden, who's uh, one of the legendary coaches of all time, depending on uh, who's counting. Some count him as the winningest coach of all time. A lot of wins for that man. But most of all, he was an amazing, amazing Christian guy. And he was very upfront about his faith. Uh, He would share the gospel with, with the team pretty frequently. I also learned a lot about leadership from that man, about empowering others to do their jobs and how to lead a big organization. And then uh, another mentor in college that I was really more personal with was Coach Dave Van Hallinger, who was our strength coach and our FCA sponsor. Uh, You know, your strength coach, when you're on the football team, you spend all year with that guy. So, you know, in the weight room and really became close with Coach Van and he's an amazing guy as well. So, and then obviously I would consider you a strong mentor through high school. You taught me, Doug, that being a Christian 
doesn't have to be boring. You can, you know, it can be a fun thing. You can have a good time and still love the Lord. And God's a God of joy, you know, and I, I learned that from you. And another guy that went to our church was Fred Rordans, who was a Sunday school teacher for the high school. And, and he was a, I remember him as an influence because he was a very successful businessman, but also had a great faith, and that guided him in the business world. I can see that at play today. So I've had a lot of great mentors. I'm so blessed, for sure. And one thing about the guys that you are just mentioning, they're continuing on. It's not as though there was a period of time when they were those men of integrity, but these guys are still men of integrity, just like you are, that you're mentioning their names, uh, because integrity and longevity of integrity and character are what matters. Yeah, those guys have proven it. They're still doing it. Tell me uh, about your children, though. We talked about all the different places, you know, your children have been. Tell me in the world where um, one of your girls is right now. It's amazing when your kids start to grow up. You've seen that with with your guys, with your gang, to, to see them figure out who they are in the Lord and what their mission is in life. Mm-hmm. And, and so starting to see the kids that way, our oldest daughter, Lacey, she is a, a type one diabetic that has inspired her to major in health and nutrition promotion at Appalachian State, your alma, alma mater. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Wow. And uh, she uh, actually took some time in the middle of her college career uh, to go. Uh, she studied in Wales for a while with YWAM, uh, went through their discipleship training program, uh, worked with inner city kids there, and then uh, was deployed to Malawi in Africa to work in an orphanage. And she had the opportunity to, to I forget how many hundreds of kids that they fed every day. So she was able to put her nutrition and health promotion to work there. So as a result, she's a little bit behind in terms of finishing up school, but for a very good reason. So she'll graduate in December. Um, And then our second daughter, Kaylee, uh, majored in global studies. It doesn't get any broader than that. She studied the world. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, There you go. She she just graduated um, from Appalachian in uh, the spring, uh, Mm -hmm. and she is engaged to be married in the fall, and we couldn't be more excited. Um, Kaylee is amazing. I mean, she, I don't think she made a B in her whole college career. She finished with all A's. She's studied abroad. She went to Switzerland. She went to Italy. She went to France. Um, and now she's on staff with our church as a producer. And our, our church, Elevation Church, is internationally known and does a lot of amazing creative things with film and video. And so she's gotten on staff producing that stuff. She does amazing work. And her uh, fiance, Jacob, is uh, basically a film director, cinematographer. He can edit. He can shoot, he can direct. Uh, so that that's a dynamic duo right there. And they're getting to work together, uh, some projects together, some projects separately, but it's kind of cool. They get to go to the same place for work every day. And then Mallory, our third daughter, just got back from Cambodia and Vietnam, did her discipleship training in, in New Zealand for YWAM and uh, had an amazing experience, worked with children in poverty, worked with women that are coming out of human trafficking there and just had an amazing experience. And she's just praying uh, about what she's going to do next. I mean, I I wouldn't be surprised if she went into full-time mission work, uh, at least for now. And then we have Hallie as our ninth grader, and uh, she is a cheerleader, is excited about being in high school. And then we've got our only boy, Zach, who is 12. He's in seventh grade. He's playing football. He's he's a cool dude. So we're excited to see about see what God has for them as well. But they're all great kids. All of my kids have made personal decisions for Christ, which is the biggest biggest step in life. Stepped forward and became baptized. It's going to be amazing to see what God does in their lives for sure. You know, you've released your children to do those things. Now, we came, when I met you in Eustis, Florida, very small town. You grew up in this smaller atmosphere, uh, which is a great atmosphere. I mean, we're right outside of Orlando and all that. You were bigger than life. You were one of those unassuming guys. And I want to talk about that in reference to your children. And that is that uh, you're very calm, cool, and collected in middle school and high school. People teased you sometimes. Uh, I remember when I met you, and one time I tried to push you in a pool, and I'm like 5'5", five, five, and I probably weighed about 135. And you're, <laughs> are you what, 6'4", six, 6'5"? Six, I forget what you are, somewhere in there. 6'4". Uh, so I, I tried to push you in the pool, and I remember hitting you, and it was like, there's a brick wall. Anyway, so. <laughs> and then you go. I'm a little smaller these days now that I'm not playing anymore. Well, so maybe you, could, maybe you could move me a little bit. Maybe a little bit. Maybe a little bit. Yeah. And I'm a little bigger. So anyway. <laughs> 
The one thing that uh, that you did was you walked on at Florida State, and I'm going to say those things in context to your kids because I want to go back to your children and you and Lori and what y'all have done and how you've released them because parents don't do that. Parents are afraid to do that. I've heard them say, yeah, maybe someday, but I really, I just know I don't think so. As far as going uh, into mission, student missions to see the world and see what the rest of the world is like. I'm saying you walked on at Florida State. What a very courageous thing to do. You stayed in one time, I believe, if I remember correctly, you you got the uh, award for King of the Mats. Matt yes. was King of the Mats. So tell us what King of the Mats was. Well, what did you have to just, accomplish? It just meant I was the best Matt on the team and I was the only one. So it was, <laughs> I don't think it so. was pretty easy. <laughs> I don't no, think so. <laughs> uh, no, um, Matt drills were uh, these famous or infamous uh, pre-spring drills that happened in February at Florida State. And we would go into this this gym and then rotate out under the stadium. We had all these different stations we went to. And it was like a solid, I don't know, hour and 20 minutes of just pure torture of uh, running drills at full speed. And if you didn't run them at full speed, the coaches were jumping down your throat. And uh, there was no water during that period. Coaches were yelling and screaming at you. And, and uh, it was really a mental toughness of exercise more than anything. Yeah, my senior year, I... I was awarded uh, King of the Mats. They they awarded one for, I think, for each of the position groups. So I got it for the big boys, for the linemen. I had that yellow t-shirt to this day uh, with King of the Mats on it because it was a uh, it was a big honor for sure. And you were in there with some famous guys. Tell us some of the famous guys that you played football with. Yeah, Deion Sanders, Charlie Ward, uh, Brad Johnson, who quarterbacked the uh, Super Bowl winning Tampa Bay Bucks team. Uh, Leroy Butler, who invented the Lambeau Leap at uh, – at uh, Green Bay. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on about the great guys that, that I got to play with, for sure. And the reason I wanted you to say that is because when, when we're talking King of the Mats, we're talking walk-on, we're talking four years you did that. That's tenacity. That is endurance. That is committedness. You know, you're not getting a scholarship. You're getting a lot of the accolades these guys are, but you're having to pay the price that they didn't have to pay. They, you know, they had talent. They had all these things. They got scholarship, but you stayed in there and did the same things they did without the scholarship. That's character. That's integrity. Uh, you could have always walked away and said, you know, I've got a couple of years here. That's going to look good on my resume. But four years, you, you you stuck it out. So with that, now we're we're looking at business. We're looking at family. And I, I tell people, you don't have to be part of the a football program like, like Matt was. And to have that kind of endurance, some parents without those sports abilities can do that. And teachers and coaches... But all the teachers and coaches in Matt's life made a difference in where he is today and his parents. This is where we want to say this. We're small town. You're brought up in a small atmosphere, but you were not brought up with small people. Your parents no. thought world vision. Clark Blake yes. thought world vision. I know that what I tried to teach was world vision with with us, that it was not about where we were in life. It's how we can impact our community, how we could impact our state and our world. You know, and a, you know, all of it is under God's control, and he loves every person in this world and uh, has. And so you, you've done that. You were not bound by how small a town you're in. You went to a major university. You achieved there great things, academic achievements as well. You went on and you've you've uh, been in the advertising marketing industry uh, since college, some major places. And so that's impressive to me uh, and uh, and to many people that it has nothing to do with where you're brought up. It has everything to do with where you're focused. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, the, the Bible says to go into all the world and preach the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And uh, my parents had that perspective. They built that in me. I mean, you know about the ministry they've had over the years in Guatemala. And what's interesting is they've they've gone from Trinity and, and working in Guatemala to Biltmore Baptist Church, a huge mega church in Asheville. They're now sending people to Guatemala. And then they moved yeah. here to Charlotte and they're they're going to Carmel Baptist, another big church, and they're sending people to Guatemala. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I just saw that uh, big thinking in my parents' life and I, I saw more importantly what God could do. I mean, they, they were one of the original families that stepped out and started Trinity Church. Absolutely. And and I was able to see 
the God show up in a big way through that experience yeah. where we wanted to, you know, we wanted to get our own building and a check shows up for exactly the right amount and all of those kind of amazing stories. You know, if you just step out and let God do something big, you can see him at work. But too many times people play it safe and they don't try big things. And if you don't try big things that are beyond yourself, you're not giving God an opportunity to step in there and fill in the gaps and and show up on your behalf. And he wants to do big things. He wants to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or comprehend. And uh, we've tried to build that into our kids. I learned that from my parents. We're going to keep passing it down. Absolutely. With that, there's a couple of things that I wanted to focus on with you with those things. And tell me about your church there. I think you had something to do with their beginnings. Is that right? Well, I I knew uh, some of those guys before it started okay. and, uh, and was able to kind of look in on what they were, were planning early on. But no, I, I can't take any credit at all for the success of that church. But uh, it's called Elevation Church. You can check it out at elevation.org. But it's, uh, it's one of the fastest growing churches in America and the world. We have about 20,000 each weekend in average attendance, uh, hundreds of thousands wa- watching online and, and on TV. The church started with a band of five or six couples that moved from Shelby, North Carolina, which is like an hour from Charlotte, and it is in the sticks. I mean, you talk about small town. I mean, it's, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's more country than Eustace, let's put it that way. <laughs> and, and I knew a couple of those guys, and they were just involved in a small church there. But Pastor Stephen Furtick, the, the lead pastor now, was 26 years old, and uh, he had felt a call of God since he was 16 to start a church someday, and, and God just moved in his heart to start start it then. Uh, That was 10 years ago. So he's still a youngster at 36. When they were moving to town, uh, Pastor Larry Bry, who is pastor of our university campus, and the church has multiple campuses, he called me up and just said, hey, Matt, we're uh, moving to Charlotte and starting a church. And I'm like, you what? And <laughs> like, yeah, uh, we'd love to pick your brain about Charlotte and throw some ideas at you about what we're thinking. And so I had Larry over and Pastor Steven, this 26-year-old kid, uh, gave him a little tour of the office. And then we went to lunch and they have shown me the logo and the name. And uh, they had all these great ideas for how they were going to spread the word. And they just had this fire in their belly and this anticipation of what God was going to do. And I just knew that God's going to do big things with these guys. So I watched them just take off (laughs) over the next couple of years. And I was involved in another church, was sort of watching from a distance. Uh, But then we moved to a different part of town through a series of circumstances. And uh, it was just the right time to join up. And that was eight years ago. So I joined about two years in. It's just been insane to see what God is doing through that church. But you know, it's a, it's a Matt Ferguson uh, size church. And I know the story and someday we will interview your pastor and have him talk about, express some things to youth workers because uh, the things he accomplished for a young man was amazing. And it's the whole David and Goliath effect. If you want uh, a learning from our church about youth work, they have a really interesting philosophy. And that is they really don't have a youth program, so to speak. They have small groups uh, which are, as you know, really important for building relationships. The church is energetic and relevant enough that it just appeals to, to youth. And, and they'll have events like maybe once a month where everybody gets together and has a great time. They have summer camp in the summer. By the time you're in sixth grade, they're like, okay, you're, you're ready to contribute to the church. You're not going to sit there and be a consumer. We want you to start volunteering now. Yeah. Zach, Zach's 12. He's started volunteering in production in our kids' ministry last year as soon as he got into sixth grade. And then, you know, Hallie's been working with the kids, with the children. It's it's just raising up this group of young people that uh, are ready to take on the world. My, my daughter, Mallory, got to be in uh, Pastor Stevens group for a while. He does a, a group of uh, high school juniors and takes them through some pretty rigorous curriculum. And Mallory got to do that. Uh, there's just so many great opportunities for young people there, even though they don't have a youth group, so to speak. No, I think it's a great uh, a great concept because it's not about one design. It's about what reaches people. And it's obviously doing an incredible job with your family uh, because it's a, it's a co-conspiracy when, <laughs> with youth workers, whether those are teachers or coaches as well as full-time youth workers in the church, volunteers, and the parents, because you parents know more about your children than us youth workers will ever know. And that was a big enlightenment to me to realize, you know what? I may know these students, but it's better for me to really know what their parents know about them. 
uh, as well as my getting to know them and, um, and as well as volunteers. Different things that your, your church is doing is um, right on target. The other thing that they do that I, I really learned from you early on, Doug, is that everything at the church should be done with excellence, uh, at, at the highest level of excellence. If there's one piece of advice that you could give youth workers, uh, and, and that means coaches, teachers, youth pastors, volunteers, what would it be? You know, this this is something that I've heard our, our pastor reinforce a lot, and he was a, a youth speaker before he uh, started the church. But, you know, too often we want to tell kids no, that you, you shouldn't do this, and, and all of those rules are important. Um, but the reason those rules are in place is that God wants what's best for us. Whenever we do any coaching or counseling and talk about what you should and shouldn't do, it should be in the context of what God wants for you. He's got great things for you. So don't don't derail it by having sex before marriage or by cheating in school or by uh, any of the things that young people, alcohol and drugs, anything they can get caught up in. It's not about God trying to kill your joy, but God is in the business of making our joy complete. And he's in the business of letting us live life to its very fullest. And so I think as we counsel and lead young people, it should be in the context of this is not what God wants to keep from you, but it's what God wants for you. Is there a book, a video material that you'd recommend to, to youth workers? or parents or, or both to keep them motivated? I've read so many books uh, and it's probably a, an amalgam of all of them. I would just say be a voracious reader. And, uh, you know, really the, the Bible has everything we need for life and godliness. You know, some of these ancillary books can be helpful for compiling scriptures together for us, but the Bible's the roadmap. Read the Bible and read uh, some things from the best Christian thinkers out there, then I think you'll be in good shape. Absolutely. Read Doug's book. You wrote the book on youth leaders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to get that. In fact, that's uh, going to be offered, uh, which is called Burn Up. Then the uh, second one we will have out in a few months called Rest Up. And we did not arrange this before you called. No, no, absolutely It was not. totally a spontaneous <laughs> that's, moment. That's right. And, and so any parting uh, thoughts? How did you and Lori come to the to the final decision that the very first time your stu your child went with another organization, not with you, not with their grandparents or someone to go overseas, what brought you all to that decision that it was the right thing to do? And what kind of emotions? I mean, even though I know, you know, you're for that sort of thing, as parents, we go through different emotions. And so take us there. You know, it, it's hard to let your kids go for sure emotionally. On the other hand, it was easy. Like we didn't even hesitate. Maybe Lacey was the first one to to go for a long term when she went to uh, to Africa. And then Mallory's been to, uh, to Africa as well, down to Uganda. And uh, each time it just felt like it was from the Lord because we know that's what the Lord wants us to do. Even though they're going to potentially dangerous places like uh, like Uganda, it, we just felt like they're going for a purpose and the Lord's going to protect them and everything's going to be all right. Uh, even though it's it's physically and emotionally hard to let them go, we just knew in our hearts it was the right thing to do. And we do have Skype now and we have FaceTime, so that has helped us a lot to get through it. It used to be you have to write long letters and send them off on a ship, you know. <laughs> that's right, and, that's right. Now you can just have a face-to-face -face uh, conversation with them when they're overseas. That's right. Found out my dad before he died, about the year before he died, that he was afraid. He never showed it. My dad's a very tough man, but he was afraid every time I left the country. But he never told me until that last year of his life. And because uh, he's always proud of me and thankful. I mean, I was behind the Iron Curtain in Russia, Moscow at the age of 18 and uh, things I wouldn't do with my children. I flew to New York City at 2 a.m. <laughs> trying to find my way to a hotel. Who does that? You know, nobody. Doug does that. <laughs> Doug does that. <laughs> and I wouldn't do it again or send my kids to do that, right? So, uh, but, you know, those are courageous things that you do. And thank God for FaceTime and, and uh, Skype and different things like that. How do you work in a secular environment the way you work in with major businesses and still keep your Christian ethics and morals? How do you do that, Matt? Well, um, gosh, it's it's always just kind of worked out. I live my life according to the way it's supposed to be lived, the way God says it should be. And I've just found that people appreciate it. And people that I didn't think had wanted anything to do with Christianity have come to me for advice about things. You know, I've been able to lead people to the Lord at work. It's been an amazing experience. I, I think, you know, God says, go be a light. And for the most part, people like light. Uh, for me, it's just kind of worked and people respect where I'm coming from. And I don't really shove it down 
anybody's throat. I just uh, act like I act. People seem to appreciate it. And, and it's been a platform and God has given me a lot of opportunities, even in the crazy world of advertising, which you associate with not being truthful and all that kind of stuff. But it, it's been it's been a great ride so far. I remember that, uh, and we won't mention the name of it because I haven't cleared that with you, but there was um, when you were in another city and they, they had lost an account and it's a big account, one that they wanted. I remember that that company came back because of your influence, because they wanted you on their team. Do you remember that? Yes, we were uh, we were working with this client and uh, I, I worked with also worked with another and, and I wasn't there when we lost it. I started working with an organization that this client was a part of. Of leading their advertising and we had great success and meanwhile this other company after they had moved to another agency uh, their business had kind of flattened out after a couple of years of that their leadership basically said hey we're giving it back to these guys and it was just like manna from heaven we didn't have to pitch it or anything they just walked into the office and said you're the ones you know and so I, that's just one of the many many examples of just favor that I didn't deserve that God has given. And, and he wants to do that for us. You know, that is a big deal. Favor is important to, to hear about. God, uh, he loves his children, but he especially reacts to his children that put him first. He reacts to that. It's like we do, you know, we have all we've, if you've got multiple children, you have those that push you away a little bit and those that embrace you and believe everything you say and do. And you want, you don't want to break that. There's something about that. And God says that we have to come to him like a child. And he he reacts to that. That's a great observation with you because I've seen that in your life many, many times. And, and it doesn't mean that it's all sugar-coated either because oh, no. in the same way that the, the Bible says that, you know, like a father, when we ask for bread, he's not going to give us a stone. On the other hand, it warns that in this world there will be trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's the balance. You know, it's not going to be all rosy, you know, manna from heaven and if you'll just buy one of these prayer cloths, it'll all, you know, come raining down on you. Yeah. I mean, there's there's still going to be trouble in life. And there so is. we should not, not be surprised when that happens. But there's also favor. And he also promises that if we'll love him and we'll be called according to his purpose, that he will work it all to good. It won't all be good, but he will take the bad and work it to good. That's right. And Matt, uh, I don't want to take any more of your time today. Uh, it's been amazing here. It's your work day. And it's a great background here for people to see when they see the video. Uh, and I'm just uh, I'm proud of you uh, because I know how hard you have worked. Uh, not just to be here, but in everything I've ever seen you do in life. That one change in middle school uh, has carried throughout your entire life. And the integrity and character of your parents uh, wore off on you. Your sister, Kim, can't wait to talk to Kim sometime and video her. And um, she'll be a good one. Yes, she will. She will. And uh, you guys uh, uh, were I'm very thankful for you. So listen, uh, Youth Worker Nation, this is Youth Worker on Fire and Matt Ferguson. Matt, great seeing you and great hearing from you. I can't wait for others to hear you. Good to see you, Doug. Mm -hmm.